much for being able to join us today. Um, I'm hoping that more participants would be able to join as the meeting progresses, uh, but I'm very glad and very grateful to everyone that's been able to turn up today. Um, I think that when you see a meeting like this, you it's kind of like a Japanese tea ceremony, right? So it's 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 very aesthetic. It's very um, it seems very seamless on the outside, but a lot of work uh, uh, has gone on uh, behind the scenes. And I just want to say a big thank you. Um, oh, hi, hi, John. Uh, so the ambassador has joined us. Good morning. Morning, morning. Um, so all speakers are here. So once again, thank you to everyone. And, and I was just going to say, um, I'm really grateful to all the speakers. Um, you, you guys have been almost gracious in in the way you've uh, worked with us to make this uh, possible today. Really grateful. Um, going on to the um, issue to be discussed today on security in Nigeria. I mean, I, I had a lot of conversations uh, yesterday uh, up until uh, quite late at night. And the sense I get is that Niger a lot of Nigerians um, for a long time have been concerned about the kind of uh, deteriorating security, uh, but not just concerned, there's anger, um, but increasingly there's also a sense of, I would say fear, right? Fear that the 50 kilometer drive that you used to take for decades uh, might no longer be safe. Fear that the gates that kept you and your family safe for decades would no longer be enough. Fear that your high fences, your barbed wires, your security uh, would no longer be enough. Um, and I, I, I heard a lot of very, very disturbing stories uh, um, along these lines. I was speaking to someone yesterday and they said that, well, if you are stuck in traffic in the wrong place at the wrong time, things could go very poorly from there. Right. And it's not just uh, the civilians or the personal acquaintances. Uh, just going to run through uh, some of the things that have kind of popped up recently in terms of what the lawmakers have been saying. Uh, the Benue state governor, Samuel Autumn, uh, basically called out the president and asked him to convene a national security summit uh, because things were so bad. Um, I don't know how many of you saw the video by Senator Smart Adeyemi where he basically breaks down and kind of cries in the National Assembly, saying the whole thing should be shut down because the lawmakers aren't really doing their job. Um, and uh, Mohammed Sani Musa, uh, the senator from uh, Niger East, uh, basically points out that Boko Haram are not only present in that state, they actually now collect a tax, right? Uh, they, they, it's, 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 so, it's so embarrassing where the government no longer fills these spaces where it should. And also considering that Boko Haram has been very dominant in the northeast of Nigeria, and Niger State is not in the is not in, in, in the northeast. You need to go through almost Abuja to get to Niger, but this is where we are now. Uh, Magashi, the defense minister, uh, gave a speech around how Nigeria is bleeding. Uh, Wiki, the River State Governor, made similar comments. Right. So I guess part of the question we are going to be asking today is how did we get here? Right. For such a long time, there has been almost confusion in Nigeria around artificial security relative to long term stable peace. For decades, Nigerians have used policemen, checkpoints, vigilantes, private street gates, barricades, security, metal, metal barriers. Right. And all these things to Nigerians meant security. Right. But these aren't a substitute for long term stable peace. Um, I was speaking to someone yesterday and they said it would be absurd for you to live in Nigeria today to live on a street where you don't have a kind of gate, you don't have a kind of security outfit to guard you. Because if you do that, you're left to the mercy of, of robbers, right? So again, how did we get here? Um, hopefully uh, our speakers today would be able to shed more light on this issue. Um, and uh, speaking of which, uh, the first speaker we have uh, would be Ambassador uh, John uh, Campbell. Uh, really grateful to have you here uh, with us this afternoon, Ambassador. Uh, thank you so much. Ambassador Campbell, uh, is, I mean, we have insiders and outsiders in terms of uh, security in Nigeria. And Ambassador Campbell is certainly an insider, uh, very highly regarded uh, amongst very senior uh, circles in the country, um, uh, from Ambassador of the US and Nigeria, of course. Um, and he uh, wrote a new book, Nigeria and the Nation State, Rethinking Diplomacy Within the Post-Colonial World. 
Um, and in this book, Ambassador Campbell argues that the West needs to pay more attention to not just the security situation in Nigeria, but to Nigeria in general. Um, I think that's enough uh, from me uh, for now. I'll introduce all the other speakers as we get to them. But for now, I want to pass it on to uh, Ambassador Campbell. Thank you very much again, sir. Uh, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and thank you for having me. And also thank you for the focus of this conference, um, a holistic approach to Nigeria's security crisis. Um, I understand I have only 10 minutes or so, and I will try to respect that limit um, so that there is time for the Q&A. Uh, in Washington, uh, too often briefings, and I am participating in one tomorrow with staffers on Capitol Hill, briefings feature a tour of Nigeria's security horrors. Boko Haram, farmer herder conflicts, budding separatism in the old Biafra and now in Yoruba land, operation of criminal gangs, trafficking in persons, narcotics and weapons, kidnapping, and so forth. Boko Haram, with its beheadings, murderous infighting, and possible links to the Islamic State and Al Qaeda is always the star. The usually unspoken assumption is that these are the causes of the breakdown of security rather than symptoms of a deeper malaise that interacts with more immediate events and usually in a local context. A potential root of our limited understanding of the breakdown in security in Nigeria and also in much of West Africa is the concepts and language we use to think about it. Articulated first at Westphalia in the 17th century, the concept of a nation state has been widely applied to the post-colonial world. Very often, it does not fit. For example, unlike a conventional nation state, Nigeria lacks a unifying national identity and its people little identify with the formal Nigerian state. Nigeria was created by the British for administrative convenience. They cobbled together more than 300 different ethnic groups that had little in common and had never been part of the same political entity. They certainly did not share a common religion, language, or culture, usually the precondition for most, but not all, but for most successful nation states. Nigeria was a newly created artificial entity, and the creation process was fast and short-lived. The final amalgamation of the disparate territories occurred only in 1914, and the British left in 1960, 46 years later. Compare that with my native Virginia, where the British were present for 176 years and established institutions of representative governance and accountability that continue to this day. Moreover, Many Nigerians will tell you that the country remains a colonial entity. The British have been replaced by indigenous elites as distant and unaccountable to the people as the British ever were. Post-independence, in the aftermath of coups, civil war, and oil, the Nigerian state was captured by a small cartel of self-serving elites that headed patronage clientage networks. Greased by corruption, <clears throat> they cooperated across religious and ethnic divisions just enough 
to divvy up state oil revenue and office among themselves and their clients. They otherwise did little to improve the lot of the majority of Nigerians. The system that they created was remarkably resilient under both military and civilian rule. Elites were not a closed caste. They kept the state weak, but preserved it because it was the means by which they divvied up state wealth and office. Outside the elites, Nigerians became poorer and poorer. So much so that now international financial institutions estimate that Nigeria's severely impoverished are the largest in absolute numbers in the world. And that includes India with six times its population. Cursed by the economic distortions of oil, Nigeria went from being a food exporting country to one which imports food and its vibrant manufacturing economy has largely disappeared. It is well known that the country with 215 million people generates centrally about the same amount of electricity as the city of Edinburgh. The system did, however, prevent further civil wars. There was no follow on to the 1967-70 civil war that left up to 2 million dead. And for a generation provided a modicum of security for most Nigerians. I first went to Nigeria in 1988 when the embassy was in Lagos. In 1989, a group of three female embassy officers with a car, an embassy car and driver and lots of water, spent three weeks on a familiarization visit in Northern Nigeria with no security whatsoever and none was needed. I myself uh, have been able to visit 35 of the 36 states, now almost unimaginable. At present in 2021, Embassy officers can leave Abuja uh, only with very heavy security and exhaustive and extensive prior arrangements. The freedom to travel has largely ended. But the goal of Nigeria's political culture has been the preservation of elite wealth and privilege. That culture is now under assault especially by jihadi radicalism and the assertion of winner-take-all ethnic identity, but also by the slow disintegration of central government authority. What is driving the breakdown? Part of the answer is explosive growth of population growing much faster than the economy. Part of the answer is the consequences of climate change. More than 40% of Nigeria's arable land is now subject to periodic drought. And sea levels in the Gulf of Guinea are rising faster than in almost any other part of the world. Part of the answer is the alienation of many, perhaps most, Nigerians from their government and unwillingness to cooperate with the security services, which in any event are overstretched. Part of the answer is pervasive poverty, and especially in the North, part of the answer is a religious revival that promises justice for the poor through the strict enforcement of Islamic law. What about Al-Qaeda and ISIS, you might ask? We can debate whether its presence and influence is transformative or marginal. So there are insurrections in the Northeast spreading to the Northwest and in the oil patch. Separatist sentiment is surfacing in Yoruba land and reviving in the old Biafra. Conflict over water and land often assumes an ethnic and religious coloration. 
government policy toward insurrections, the hammer, has been a failure. But there seems to be no other strategy. What is the outlook? Many thoughtful Nigerians are calling for a fundamental restructuring of the state along democratic and federal lines. They envisage a sovereign national conference in which all stakeholders would be represented. But as recently as last week, President Buhari proposed to Secretary of State Blinken that the headquarters of the United States Africa Command be moved from Stuttgart to West Africa, closer to where jihadi activity is taking place. That would not seem to presage thinking differently from the approach of the hammer now being used. Uh, thank you very much. I think I've used up my time and I'm looking forward to comments and questions. Okay, um, thank you very much for that, um, Ambassador. Um, a lot of uh, keen insight there uh, in terms of not just where Nigeria is, but also why we've gotten there, um, which is uh, one of the objectives, I think, of this uh, roundtable conference. Um, I think uh, Ambassador Campbell's point about the insecurity and the messages being put out by the consulate uh, is, is uh, germane. Um, I saw a communique around uh, almost a warning to um, officials of the uh, embassy in Lagos to be careful um, around where they can go, around what they could do, and around the kinds of crimes that have emerged over the last uh, year or so. Um, so th this, this is something that's certainly across the country, um, as he pointed out, not just a northeast issue, not just a southwest issue or a southeast issue, uh, but everywhere. Um, little fires everywhere, but maybe not so little fires sometimes. Thank you very much, um, Ambassador. Um, our next speaker is uh, the uh, former Inspector General of Police, uh, Solomon Arase. Um, this is uh, uh, this is a talk I'm really looking forward to uh, because the police in Nigeria as almost the main actor in terms of internal security. Uh, have a deep agenda around why the country is in this current state of affairs. Um, Solomon Arase um, was uh, the 18th uh, Inspector General of Police, um, and considering there have only been, uh, I think, 21 in the history of Nigeria, um, that kind of tells you uh, the importance of that position. Um, he was also the head of the topmost intelligence gathering unit of the Nigeria Police, the Criminal Investigation, Intelligence and Investigation Bureau. Um, and he also has a degree in law, so he is a lawyer as well. Um, he served in UN peacekeeping missions, and he's, he's, not just, he's not just a practitioner, he's also very much a scholar, and I have very much enjoyed uh, interacting with him. Really keen to get your thoughts uh, on what's going on in Nigeria, IGP. Uh, the floor is yours, please take over, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for having me uh, to be part of this uh, uh, conversation. Uh, Ambassador Campbell has uh, given a, a proper overview of the issues we have dealt with, you know, over the years. Um, if you want to take a look at uh, what has happened in Nigeria during the military uh, era, you will discover that most of the problems we have with internal security management can be, you know, situated within that, uh, within the purview of you know, uh, the long interregnum we had under the military. <clears throat> um, long years of military rule left indelible marks on the psychic of the people. Uh, the advent of civil democracy was like the uncocking of a pent up anger and frustration, uh, the legitimate expression of which had been thwarted by the denial of basic freedom. Uh, overflowing from that era also were smoldering flames of ethnic and religious discontent, which uh, the ambassador, you know, clearly identified in his, uh, in his uh, speech. 
And uh, the period between May 1999 to the end of 2001 witnessed a large number of ethnic and religious conflicts that the police were you know, incapable of dealing with. Uh, the question you asked me just now, why is the police, you know, why have they not been able to deal with these internal security issues uh, through the years? One of the, one of the reasons was that by the time, throughout the period of military uh, interregnum in Nigeria, there was no recruitment of police officers, you know, in Nigeria. So for a population of about 200 or 210 million, we had about 138,000 police officers. And the 138,000 police officers, half of them, half of that number, you know, were attached, as it were, to the political elites. And, you know, some of them were also specialists, the medical doctors, engineers, and all those. So you discover that the operational wing, the operational thing that we had to work with was grossly inadequate. Obasanjo quickly identified that and said, Okay, from now on, we are going to start recruiting, you know, um, men into the police force. But that also had its own, you know, setbacks because to train an average constable or a police officer takes between nine months and one year, five five months for you to be able to train, you know, officers. So the the gap was already there, and. Um, if you know how military regimes, how they operate in most West African countries, you will know how the police in Nigeria, you know, was uh, in that street. Now, the present challenges we are having is that crime in Nigeria, you can geolocate it, you know, in the, um, uh, the ambassador aptly mentioned the, the Northeast is the epicenter of, you know, terrorism. Uh, you had communal and this ethnic uh, crisis. Some they call it identity, you know. Um, they, they don't call it uh, ethnic, you know, agitations. Uh, they say it's, you know, people trying to find their, you know, ethnic identity, you know. Um, we also have issues of kidnapping. That has become a very big problem. When kidnapping started in the South South, in 2000, 2000 uh, 20, uh, 1919 and 2001, it was like uh, some group of people who were, you know, agitating for the environmental degradation of, you know, the South South. It has not become a commercial enterprise. And even now, a lot of people are saying that it looks as if, you know, the insurgency that we are dealing with, this is a branch of, you know, it because the people you are calling headsmen, uh, uh, headsmen or what, what they call them now they, they they have another name they call they call those people they say they are headsmen some are uh, militants and all these people it is believed you know are also working under it's a criminal network that they are working together we've also had political and electoral violence that i'm sure you are you are very conversant with arm robbery have been there for some time but it looks as if arm robbery is not taking a back seat because kidnapping has become more lucrative in the country. But most, one of the issues that we have to deal with in this country, which is also uh, in, uh, impacting negatively on uh, the country, is this headsmen farmers crisis and cattle rustling. This one has the potential of actually dividing the country into ethnic, you know, shape because a lot of people are going to ask questions. Are there no consequences for crime? If people, they commit crimes, they go to take over people's land, they, they kill people, is the, is the police not there, you know, as a, a main team that is supposed to do, uh, engage internal security to arrest these people and prosecute them? If, because if you arrest them and prosecute them, then it means you are setting a deterrent that crime, you know, there are, there are consequences for crime. We've also been dealing with issue of illegal bunkering and pipeline vandalization, uh, especially in the south-south uh, 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 geopolitical zone. Then the issue of proliferation of small arms and light weapons. That, are, that is a very big problem. Our borders are very, very porous. We've not been able, just yesterday or so, the president uh, came up with a tax force to, to see how they can uh, mop up this, but the arms are already here. So you, you now start wondering how 
these arms are going to be mopped up. Then if you now come to the police force, the main organization that is supposed to deal with the issue, issue of capacity. You know, at the strategic level, have we been able, do we have, you know, officers and men who are mentally mobile, who are, who are deep, you know, with the concepts of, because whenever you talk about strategies of dealing with it, the, all the things you have here in Nigeria is community policing. But community policing cannot exist in a vacuum. Community policing must exist where you have the trust, you know, where the trust between the members of the public and the police is well cemented. The, the answers wouldn't have happened if that trust was there. So there is a vacuum. We, we must have to think, you know, outside the box. How are we going to make sure that this vacuum that has been created over the years is uh, is bridged? Uh, that is why a lot of people are saying, is it only community policing that you have as a strategy for dealing with internal security? What, what about predictive policing? You know, what you call intelligence-led policing, where you don't put people in custody before you start shopping for evidence. Can't we, our custodian approach to uh, internal security management, can't it be properly managed? Our detention centers, can they be more friendly? Can we ensure that our people who ply the highways, they are treated with a lot of respect and dignity that they deserve? This is the only thing that you can use in winning the hearts and minds of the people. And when you win the hearts and minds of the people, then information flow, you know, which are usually process into intelligence, uh, will be a fence accompli. Uh, we, uh, let me quickly say, you know, uh, I am an optimist. I, I believe that the issues we are dealing with can be resolved. All we just need to do is to have a political will. Between 1999, till date, we had had four police reforms to deal with all these issues of, you know, social disorder in our country. All those ones, starting from the Obasanjo one, uh, to Yaradua, to uh, Good Luck Jonathan, white papers were issued, you know, they were published on these ones. They were short term, they were mid term, they were long term strategies of how to deal with you know, the issues we are presently dealing with. But well, none of those police reforms, you know, have been implemented. So, you know, you when when you when the NSAS came the other day, they said, oh, they were setting up a, a panels of inquiry. I said, to do what? Why can't they go back to those, you know, police reports we've, we, we, we've, we've had? Four of them with, uh, you know, the white papers published, all the issues, all the issues that we know are being raised now in civilities, human rights abuses, you know, extrajudicial uh, listing, pro, uh, tunnel view, profiling of people, all these are issues that, you know, have been dealt with in those police reforms. And uh, they, are, they are there hanging, hanging there in the shelves. So if uh, we can take a look at those ones, I'm sure that uh, part of the issues that we are dealing with in terms of training, in terms of you know recruitment, these days when you want to recruit people into the Nigerian police force, the pressure that you go through, the political elite, they want you to put in their people there. Well, even when they know they are not qualified to be there, so it's it's a it's a big mess that we have found ourselves. I I, I don't know whether I've exceeded my ten minutes. There's a lot to talk about when it comes to you know the role of the police in internal security management in Nigeria, but I'm sure I. I have exhausted my time, but if there are questions or there are gaps you want me to fill along the line, I will, I'm here to do that. Thank you very much, um, Inspector General of Police, uh, Solomon Arase, again. Uh, this has been such a useful uh, uh, contribution. I mean, the police in Nigeria, I think Nigeria is have a love-hate relationship with the police that stretches back a very long time. There's virtually no Nigerian you come across that won't have a very strong opinion one way or the other around what the police means to them. Uh, my forthcoming book is on the Nigeria police force and I think uh, what I learned in doing research for that project um, uh, which uh, the IGP has also been very helpful in, in kind of helping me wrap my thoughts around uh, these issues is that everything from the way the police was formed 
why it was formed uh, uh, in the colonial era, um, the way it was trained uh, in terms of military drill, the Royal Irish Constabulary element, um, the size of the force relative to the population, all these things uh, led to an institution that simply wasn't ready uh, to serve and protect uh, uh, when uh, the colonialists left and Nigerians uh, took uh, uh, hold of their own fates. The police question is a very pertinent one in this conversation. Uh, a few points raised here that I'll kind of flag just so uh, uh, we, we might have questions around them. The consequences of crime, uh, the IGP uh, mentioned. Are there no consequences for crime? Uh, going back to the case of the uh, prominent kidnapper, Evans. Evans, after all the uh, uh, fiasco around his arrest, what's happened to Evans? And what kind of message does that send if one of the most prominent kidnappers in Nigeria basically didn't face the law, right? That tells kidnappers that it's open season. Um, why is it the case that uh, the criminals and almost the, the, the ridiculous in society have, have uh, access to firearms and law-abiding people who have kids, who have families, who work their jobs and who try to make a decent wage they don't have any 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 recourse to to firearms. They can't protect themselves, right? People are asking these kinds of questions. Um, the uh, theme of police reform, right? There have been four white papers, like the IGP said, um, and nothing has come of it. Why is that the case? Um, and and the final point is NSAS. Uh, IGP points out that it wouldn't have happened if the trust was there. Uh, speaking to a friend of mine yesterday, and he pointed out that what we saw in terms of NSAS is a fraction of the anger. Uh, and the ground swell of frustration uh, that's present in Nigeria today, and that it's a powder keg that could very easily be ignited. I think all these points are, are themes that hopefully uh, we'll get to during the Q&A. Uh, but let me go to our next uh, speaker, uh, Fumi. And uh, uh, Fumi has her hands in all kinds of pies, right? We first met, believe it or not, um, in a British army installation many, many years ago now. Um, she, I mean, she has interviewed uh, a lot of the top people in the country, including the current president. She is a film producer. Uh, she's got a, a three-part series commissioned by the BBC called My Country, Nigeria. You really want to have a look at that. Um, she also has a number of very impressive, and I'm talking Hollywood-level impressive projects. Uh, Fumi is very good at what she does, but she is also someone that brings a very unique perspective to the security conversation. Um, she is one of the BBC's 100 men to watch um, and, and um, one of the Forbes 20 power women in Africa. You guys are really going to enjoy her. Uh, Fumi, the floor is yours. Thank you. Fumi, I think you're on mute. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'm always polite. I mute myself during this session. I said after that introduction, I, I myself sit down and wonder exactly what it is that I do. And um, uh, after following after the ambassador and the um, IGP, I thought they laid a really, really good foundation for the um, well, what I'm going to bring to the table, I see myself as a, you know, kind of like the fly on the wall in Nigeria in many, many uh, spaces and through the years, um, having sat down and done television for so long. I'm going to start and start from where the ambassador, a very important point the ambassador made, and that's the fact that Nigeria is a non-state. And if we pay back a little to what Nigeria really is, we must think that if we take into consideration the history of slavery and colonization, you have brought together over 300 different cultures who do not trust one another. Because for over 500 years, they've been reading and slaving and so on and so forth. These are fault lines that already sit in the darkness waiting to jump at the people at any given time. That said, the question I wanted to ask is, um, the military, we, we said post-military, is Nigeria really post-military? Um, the current president, President um, Muhammadu Buhari, is maybe one of the last of the generation of uh, men, and I repeat men, um, who um, were in the army 
at the beginning of the war, who were part of the original coup that led to the war. I'll go back a little bit later on to that particular um, point. And that's to say the sense of the military pervades throughout Nigeria's consciousness up until now. The other question to ask is what sort of security forces does Nigeria have? Nigeria's security forces were designed originally to protect the British and their interests. I'm sure that that's going to come out in your book. And in that say, um, therefore, they're doing their job because who replaced British interest? A small band of Nigeria's elite, a patronage-based elite that's unimaginative and, un and non-innovative because it's never had to. Because of course, soon after independent Nigeria discovered oil and was, you know, it was time to just play for this um, uh, for this elite. In sitting and doing my job, I'll say this: that one of the reasons why the security for the security issue has become so frightening to many people is because all of a sudden it's affected. Well, not all of a sudden now. It's really in the front gates of Nigeria's small patronage and non-imaginative, non-innovative elite. Uh, because for years, the average Nigerian has been dealing with this. For example, my mother disappeared when I was nine. Nobody ever found her. Nothing ever happened. Nobody told us what happened. I remember the first time I had the word arm robber in my life. I was maybe five. My mother was saying to me that there had been an arm robbery next door to us. And I remember being shocked at the idea because I asked her, what's an armed robber? And she said, you know, somebody who brings a gun to your home to rob. Prior to that, I knew about um, um, what they call them, them burglars. There were no armed robbers to my memory. I must have been maybe six or seven actually around about that time. I remember that conversation very clearly because it really, really scared me. It was important what time in one time in Nigeria that was because that was in the early 70s. I was born in 1971. Um, so the first time I would hear about armed robbery would be in the 70s. And all older people have corroborated that, that prior to the um, Civil War, we didn't have that much weapons out there and that many unemployed young men who therefore needed to find you know, a way. And I'll go back to how crime became the rational thing to do in Nigeria. And I really want us to take this seriously, that crime and corruption became the rational thing to do in Nigeria. And that's not to say that it's the right thing, I said the rational thing. After the Civil War and the first set of armed, and the first set of um, proliferation of armed um, arms in Nigeria, you then started to have different layers of that happening over and over again. After that, of course, we had the period of post-war, we had pro period of prosperity with oil. Also, side by side with all Nigeria's challenges, mostly to measure what the oil prices nationally were also doing at that time. From then, we went on to the 80s, and the 80s were what they were. Then the coups of the 80s that brought um, the next the, the um, the next set of military officers into the country and what they did throughout the time to try and solidify their position of power by decimating institutions, decimating culture, education, and all those all, all that happening at the same time. By the end of the 90s, you had a new set of crime coming. And that was when we started to talk and hear about internet about the use of the credit card for fraud, was drugs and fraud. After that, you had a new wave that started with the agitation for liberation of the Niger Delta and resource control. With all of that in militancy. After that, in, at the back of that, armed robbery continued. Other forms of crimes continued. Kidnapping itself became an issue around about 2004, 2000 and thereabout. A lot of that happening around the southeast, southwestern part of Nigeria. Prior to that, the north seem to have a different sort of problem until, of course, Boko Haram came upon. I could go into a, a, a comparison if we start putting um, side by side some of the things that were happening internationally and what was happening in Nigeria and how that affected Nigeria's own trajectory with security. But I also remember that as a TV presenter, I would sit on the breakfast show in the morning and people were coming from different parts of Nigeria to tell stories of what was already happening. As far back as 2003, I remember people, up to 100 people came to the studio then, mostly women. They had come from Kaduna State. 
and that is kids on ballroom that had happened in Kaduna State. There are also people coming from the Niger Delta area where the security forces were crushing people's insur insurgency. I remember Odi because I interviewed quite a number of people from that community at that time. So throughout the years, down the decades, this um, the, the, the point was sort of boiling and we sat in it. What was happening, um, um, what, what, what then happened with Boko Haram, of course, was I remember clearly actually in 2006 when we were having a conversation at the Tutu Fellowship and I said, what do you think would happen? Because how are people coping with the resource issue? Because I really think that as all human societies, Nigeria's real issue, aside from being, because, because it is a non-state, because the, the monopoly of violence for the state, which the state should have, has been directed not as, as protecting the people, but as securing a small elite that benefits from only one major product, and that's oil. That means we are not developing other forms of resources, we are not developing human capacity. We are also not developing technology and innovations. So it means that the people have to pair back to the most basic way of surviving. And the most basic way of surviving is selling something. If you are not selling a commodity, then you are selling human beings, which at the end of the day is what kidnapping is. That's what you steal a human being and you ask for ransom. If they pay you, you give it back. If they are not paying you, you kill that person. And Really, that's what it is. And so you have that situation going down until the time of Boko Haram. With Boko Haram, it was very interesting because I did say then, I remember saying that we were having a situation of polarization, religious polarization, which at the, at the root of it really is once again resource issue because people are poor and the population is exploding. The number of people who are now getting access to arms, one from the civil war, through the years, through the militancy, through all the political upheavals and sponsored also by politicians, where they then bring in arm, the base of the, the um, people in the country who now have access to violence also is expanding. Bear in mind, of course, also that the security forces themselves, because of the decimation of those forces, especially the police and all of that, you then have all sorts of um, characters in the police who themselves could be a criminal. I mean, I'm sure the IDP knows this already. So then the base for monopoly of power among people becomes wider in competition for the monopoly of power in the state. That continued through the years until you got to Boko Haram, where it hits a point that was actually a little more dangerous because you are not dealing with people whose quest for resource is not just about surviving, but also bigger than themselves. This you must also juxtaposition with extremism also coming from the southern part of Nigeria. That is not to say the northern part of Nigeria is, most, is only Muslim. Because oftentimes when we talk about jihadism and um, um, Islamic fundamentalism, we do not talk also about the, um, the, 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 co the corresponding, you know, other uh, polar side of Christian extremism because in many other parts of the country especially the northern the southern part the other way people have coped with increasing poverty through the years is to become more and more pious christian after 9 11 and all the horrible thing that happened and america's own reaction to uh, the unfortunate uh, situation well, you found this you found a, a curious thing happening in nigeria where there was a lot of investment in Christian organizations who were promoting Islamophobic ideas. And on the other side, you found other parts of the world who were also promoting, you know, um, extreme Islamic views. This went into the same pot that's already boiling down the years. So then you had Boko Haram, and then you had on the back of that banditry, because Boko Haram itself became corrupt. So within, within then, and the extreme religious um, um, factors. And then now you are now having criminal elements who come out of that. And then some other people take advantage of all of that. So then you have the so-called um, Fulani banditry uh, happening in Nigeria. I mean, I'm trying to, because I'm trying to think of it all, all at the same time. And it's even, even now thinking about it, it's really upsetting. What has therefore happened is that you have a situation where the people in Nigeria through the years, because the opportunities for 
really progressing as a human being or surviving is mostly dependent on an ability to circumvent the state, to get around the state, to, to cheat the state one way or another. It breeds a culture of understanding and um, sort of like being passive about one corruption to crime until it becomes too big and too dangerous as it has become now. So what then happens where we are at now? I'm fascinated because it's been a long time that people have been talking about calling a sovereign national conference. But I'm very interested in the idea of resource and what it does, because the resource issue in Nigeria, of course, must be taken seriously. Through the years, oil, oil is going to be a non-issue issue in a few decades. On the back of that is all the environmental degradation that's happened, the erosion in the, in the eastern part of the country, the desertification in the northern part of the country, the child issue, and what that has done in terms of what people can actually do. At the back of that also is through the years, the education system is decimated, institutions have been decimated. So the opportunities to actually make money and to make a living are limited. Uh, but of course, there's also the, the, the place of technology and what that is doing. What would happen? There are three there are three scenarios in my mind. There's a scenario of complete anarchy where Nigeria goes into, you know, balkanizes, breaks down, there's a war and all of that. People talk about that all the time. There's also the other situation where maybe we do the sensible thing and call for a national conference where we start to actually give resources back to people so that people own resources, especially the people who do not trust one another because they come from a history of colonization and slavery. So therefore, if the resource is yours, you determine what you do with the resource and you contribute to the center. That's a, that's the that's a second option. The third option, and that's calling a referendum, that's redetermining what Nigeria is, and then actually choosing a cohesive idea to build the nation around. That's the second one. The third option is very interesting to me, and that came to my mind with COVID. Because at the beginning of COVID, when the Nigeria elite realized that, A, we cannot run, there's nowhere to run to, nobody is going to take us. It becomes survival of the fittest and survival of my own people for every nation in the world. There was a curious bonding together. The Nigerian elite has always been able to bond, bond together against the people. What has happened is that the number of the people and the, the monopoly to violence within and amongst, and the capacity for that amongst the people has become too big now for the elite to manage. So but they bond together and they started to act very rapidly to do the right thing until it became clear that actually it looks like Nigeria might be escaping the doomsday scenario for COVID. I'm then thinking what would be in the best interest of the elite? Bear in mind that through the years, because of these same issues, we have not been lucky enough to allow a situation where more clever people, especially women people, got into positions of power and opportunity. So maybe we could have more innovation, maybe we could have more creativity, maybe we could have more imagination. But with the situation on hands, where one for the first time, I think the elite is properly scared, the people are properly scared and angry. You have an army of younger people who have other forms of power, you know, some of it that has to do with technology and also resources that they cannot, the state cannot easily touch. I'm talking about cryptocurrency and all of that. What happens if those kind of people were to somehow be able to circumvent the current elite, especially as a lot of them are militarized or that I'm going to pass on naturally? Those are the three scenarios I'm interested in um, whilst looking at the future of Nigeria. Thank you. For me, thank you so much for that uh, contribution. Lots of key points to emerge. Uh, there. Just very briefly, I'll highlight a couple of them. Uh, that question of a national conference um, and if um, that would ever come to light. And the second uh, point uh, to raise is this idea that uh, 300 ethnicities uh, kind of uh, juxtaposed, not just juxtaposed, but also actually just forced to meld into a single pot where um, not all these ethnicities trusted each other. What happens there? And the third point, and this was a uh, recurrent theme throughout uh, Fumi's contribution, uh, is this question of armed robberies. Um, and uh, my thesis is uh, that I've been trying to develop is that armed robberies in Nigeria really emerged uh, at the tail end of the civil war. Um, and I think that the Nigerian government has, and, and I, I talk, I go into a lot of detail about that in, in one of my forthcoming works. And I think that the Nigerian uh, government has only ever responded 
to the symptoms, right? Examples would be the uh, decree number 47 of 1970, right, that legalized the public execution of armed robbers, right? And I'm sure uh, some of us might remember the very large public executions at Bar Beach, right? People screaming on television, Oyenusi, Falon Rusha, AK Onilis, uh, Mighty Joe, Ishiaku, all, all those, all, all those lot. And then later on, uh, there, were, there were even more of them. And then when Buhari comes to power, he then puts in uh, the Robbery and Firearms Special Provisions Act of 1984, right? Again, uh, almost trying to treat the symptoms. Uh, and then you had the likes of, of Anini come through and those two were executed. Then you had the Special Arms Robbery squ Squads come through in Lagos in the early 1990s. But again, trying to respond to the symptoms. And I think that this kind of confusion between artificial security and long-term stable peace is something that's really endured. Okay, uh, our final speaker and our anchor for this event, um, and I'm going on record to say this, that there is no academic I respect more in the whole world than uh, Professor Fumi Alonisaki. Uh, deep, deep, deep respect. Um, I mean, Fumi is is just, I mean, her record is so strong. I don't think there is uh, a more prominent uh, professor of African security um, in uh, the UK today. Um, and she is the Vice President and Vice Principal International and Professor of Security Leadership and Development at King's College London. Uh, she founded the Africa Leadership Center, uh, which aims to build the next generation of African scholars. Um, she, she has worked with the UN. I would spend at least approximately six hours just reading out what she has accomplished in the last six months. So I'll kind of truncate this and just let uh, uh, Professor Loni Saki uh, 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 coming here and, and share her thoughts. Thank you. So the floor is yours. For many, you have sufficiently embarrassed me, and I know what my sister uh, for me, you know, that was talking about at the beginning of her own presentation. But, but let me thank you uh, for, you know, uh, and you and your colleagues for putting this together and for this kind uh, invitation today. I, I think this discussion couldn't be more timely. I, and I have listened to our, our three uh, speakers. You know, they have spoken eloquently and gone to the heart, to the substance uh, of the challenge uh, of security in Nigeria. So I, I want to do uh, three sets of things uh, to, to bring us uh, to the end of this uh, set of presentations and into our discussion. The, the, the first is to give some conceptual treatment uh, to to this challenge, to the set of challenges uh, that we have outlined here. Uh, the second uh, also is to give some context uh, to what we've heard uh, and uh, maybe also surface some ideas. We've done that um, also very robustly in the last um, half an hour or so or many. And the last is to is to argue very strongly. Uh, and at the heart of this, I am trying to make a case uh, for what I call a, a grand armistice uh, for Nigeria. Uh, and why do I do that? Then let me start with my first set of points, uh, which is, you know, that that set of points is uh, quite conceptual. I liked uh, your proposal uh, where, about, this, about security in post-military Nigeria. Now I've gone on to really think about the idea of post-military. Uh, and I think for me, started to deal with that, but, but, but what is it fundamentally going to, to treat this conceptually? I, I think it requires that we fundamentally challenge some long-held beliefs and views about, uh, you know, what is seemingly an objective reality. Uh, and I think um, both the ambassador and, and Fumi spoke to this, and Fumi called it by its name, really. Uh, you know, this question of the military's role in guaranteeing the supremacy of the state and by extension, the authority of the leaders of the state, which is now seriously con con you know, contested. So, so the first, therefore, is the idea of the monopoly uh, of the means of violence, which has become so mythical in Africa, but actually is a myth uh, in the case of Nigeria at this moment. And the second is what constitutes, what I think constitutes a state of war, is about what constitutes a state of war and the terms on which wars and hostilities end especially when you're talking about wars within state. You would then want to question, are we in a state of war in Nigeria? Is that what I'm saying? Uh, but actually, <laughs> let's face it, the wide variety of insecurities uh, that Ambassador Campbell uh, mentioned earlier uh, really would amount to a situation of war uh, on several fronts. 
And my argument here is that all of these wars are still mated at this point in time for some of the reasons that I think um, my uh, our previous speakers have spoken to. So, so in a sense, the current state of insecurity in Nigeria is a consequence of not bringing this post-military idea to bear uh, in a practical sense. And of course, the accompanying realities of that uh, are clear. So in addition to the valid statements that have been made um, by all our speakers, uh, Ambassador Campbell yeah. alluded to this, uh, the IGP, um, uh, Fumi did as well, and, uh, and it, uh, several of them are worth reiterating, reiterating. That of the political culture that reinforces the superiority and prioritization of elite interests against the majority of Nigerians is at the heart of it. Ambassador spoke to it. The reliance on a colonial concept of using the security uh, establishment to subjugate the people. Uh, and the, uh, the IGP, IGP was uh, talking about this for police reforms. But look at the heart of it. They have been based uh, on, on a colonial idea of what policing is used for. So we simply had one, uh, you know, a set of the inheritance elite, our current, uh, you know, the elite post-colonial post, uh, uh, elite replaced the colonial elite. Nothing much changed. But the emergence of a 21st century generation, Generation Z, that is ready to contest the elite appropriation of societal freedoms and fundamental rights, uh, including that, you know, that has now led to widespread poverty, and all the situations that we've had. And the form is correct in, in suggesting that actually this elite has access to other sources of power, not least information, new ways of organizing, transnational organizing. Um, look at what we saw uh, with the NSARS movement, which actually may seem to be quiet, but uh, any wise set of elite who realize that they're not exactly quiet, they're organizing differently. All right, and they're organizing not by viciousness or violence of the civil wars we saw in Liberia, Sierra Leone, and Co. in the in the uh, early 2000s or, or the late 90s, but by other forms of, you know, rejectionist movements against the state. Uh, and let's bear that in mind. So, so we have seen, therefore, a complete demystification of the security establishment, dismissed as as not fit for purpose. As a student of war studies, though. My heart bleeds for, for the military establishment in Nigeria and elsewhere because we have seen a misuse of the military for purposes that they were not really created for. That is at the heart of the matter. So in short, uh, the state, contextualizing this even further, the state, specifically the military, does not have monopoly over the means of violence. There are clear contestations between the state and other bearers of arms. I think Fumi was alluding to that. But what's more, these irregular forces are not easily identified, uh, identifiable, but I'll come to that when I talk to this question of armistice now. But, but the focus on military solutions for more than a decade, albeit with a social component as we've seen in the presidential initiative for Northeast Nigeria, but in the last 12 years, this has, brought, has not brought a different result. Uh, and you know the saying uh, that it is madness to do the same thing over and over again and expect a different set of results or outcomes. So, so, so Nigeria is effectively locked in the multiple battles. All right. If this were a conventional war, it will be clear that there's a stalemate. Uh, or indeed, what we have is a still is stalemate on all fronts, um, and no part of the country is left untouched. I no, I need not rehash what has already been eloquently described. Uh, by these three speakers. So, so my, my central argument here uh, is that really there's a basis to pursue a strategic peace in Nigeria, uh, all right? And we need to start with a grand armistice. Uh, you know, it is the minimum that we require uh, to bring an end to the violence uh, on all fronts in Nigeria, particularly against innocent, ordinary citizens. It's an important first step. Uh, uh, it's by no means a panacea. OK, it's, a, it's an important first step because the, the, the collective search for lasting peace uh, has to start from here. All right. It is an agreement by all the parties to cease hostilities pending an agreement to find stable peace. The state cannot, can no longer. Uh, and I think that's the attitude we've been seeing for some time. The state and leaders of the state can no longer claim to want to be victorious against their own citizens if peace is supposed to reign. How do you find peace 
when actually you've, you've turned your security establishment to fight uh, <laughs> the, the very citizens that you're supposed to protect, um, it will not work and it cannot be a continuous solution. And this call uh, for uh, the, 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 the call for, for Africa uh, command is very, very, uh, it's a very, very difficult, slippery slope. So, so, but, but the key question intellectually and practically, if I'm arguing for a grand armistice for Nigeria, can uh, armistices in a sense be said to apply within states or in situations where of official hostilities were not, were not actually in the first instance declared? So yet in Nigeria, you have hostilities that have manifestations that are not in the form of conventional warfare for which conventional forces have had to respond. It is not what form of violence, what form violence takes uh, in a sense that ought to matter more than the fact of the violence and the impact on the people and their way of life, their daily life, which Fumi has spoken eloquently to. It is clear that the security apparatus can no longer contain the degree or the range of violence that exists in Nigeria. So this instrument itself is stretched beyond its capacity. It's been abused uh, by the governing elite and can even be said to be misused for crises that could not be solved, you know, that could be solved rather by other means. So, so the assumptions that are already implicit, and I think it's even more than implicit, if you listen to some of the points that have been made, that the military is ill-equipped to fight this kind of unconventional war, all right? Nor is it its remit to tackle the non-military security challenges posed um, by all the banditry, kidnapping, and so on that we've seen. There are under, underlying structural forces, uh, issues that have to be dealt with. So we are in a stalemate situation. If we agree that such a stalemate exists, we, much, we will must confront the possibility and reality that as a matter of urgency, the state, the Nigerian state, must sue uh, for peace. So if, you, if we argue, uh, all right, if this argument is made and it's accepted, what we've been talking about as restructuring, We've had different elements of this in the past. It cannot be a restructuring that is overseen by the governing elite if it's supposed to be worth its salt, but it must be sanctioned by them as one of many parties, all right, uh, to, the to a conflict, all right, battling for the soul of Nigeria. A settlement or peace conference that will have all stakeholders at the table, it must of necessity include, if you like, the home-based terror groups, bandits, kidnappers, farmer herders, the government themselves, and the ordinary people afflicted by these conflicts, and of course the governing elite. No one can be left out of such a peace conversation. And I'm deliberate, I've referred to conversation elsewhere. The notion of it is not that you're dialoguing alone, it's the, you need to deal with both the overtness and the covertness of it, because even the violence itself is part of a conversation with the state. It is not a matter for elites only, it's a matter for all Nigerians, whatever side they have been on in the last two decades. And of course, this idea seems really controversial on the surface of it, because you'd say, how do we negotiate with terrorists and so on? But really, you can look at the controversy and say it will, this will accord on deserved degree of le legitimacy to the battle bandits, to Boko Haram, etc. The message this sends is that the Nigerian state has failed to maintain its primary responsibility for the maintenance of uh, law and order. And yes, it has. Let's not begin to romanticize that. You might argue that it's unrealistic that we are proposing armistice and a peace conference with enemies of the state, if you like, most uh, of them unseen, bandits, kidnappers, and so on who operate in opacity. But you can argue that these actors, even if they're unseen, they're not unknown. Boko Haram, Iswap, Fama Herders, they all have, IPOB, name them. They all have important stakeholders and they're supported by social system for all the reasons that uh, Fumi, the IGP and the ambassador have talked about. So if this seemingly absurd idea were to be agreed to by the governing elite, who stand to lose uh, or gain, depending on what they see, if they're short-sighted, they think they, they have much to lose for the for the purpose, you know, for the reasons of the political culture that has been mentioned by the ambassador. But the, if the obstacles are overcome, and I'm winding, I'm about to uh, wind up, many, the outcomes to be sought must not be in doubt. They must be clear to everyone that you need some kind of grand bargain. Its terms have to be clearly set, and the blueprint for peace and stability in which every citizen has a stake must be secured. 
and it cannot be in some narrow uh, restructuring uh, conversation that we've been having. Nothing short of this would do. It must be a national conversation that brings together the silent, the marginalized, the powerful, the influential, and the conversable spaces have to be well defined. And you know, you know about those conversive, conversable spaces in conversation uh, theory. So, of course, I, I'm not uh, uh, naive enough to think that this will not be a hard pill uh, to solo for the governing elite, uh, and also uh, many of the law-abiding citizens who have already been polarized. Uh, in many ways. The country is too polarized, uh, but we have to really think about the consequences of not doing this. So in reality, this will be the renegotiation of the Nigerian state, which has been long overdue, of a colonial state, which is long overdue. If due to a stroke of luck, we find a critical mass of Nigerians who, who find the idea of a grand armistice plausible and possible, it will be a master stroke. Uh, for, for this is how fast the security situation uh, needed to deteriorate uh, in order to negotiate or to renegotiate uh, a state that would deliver security for the collective and not just a chosen few uh, elite, as has been said. The alternative is to face a situation where Nigeria's governing elite will sleepwalk, uh, if you like, into a state of anarchy. And I, I fear that we're already doing that. And it's not a military solution that we need. Uh, but if we don't do that, then we'll have no choice but to return the, you know, to the place where we should, uh, you know, uh, we should have gone in the first instance. If we don't heed uh, this advice now, we'll still return to the idea uh, of a grand armistice. This is a proposal I wanted to put on the table as a way to close our conversation. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for that uh, contribution, uh, Professor Lonnie Saking. Um, anarchy, anarchy, interesting. So <laughs> students of international relations, wh when you hear anarchy, it's not that anarchy. This is this is the real anarchy we're talking about, uh, just, just to clarify. Um, and this idea of a hard pill to swallow, a strategic conversation and a grand amethyst, right? So how do we how do we get there? How, and how many people would buy into this, right? So the ESN, Eastern Security Network, IPOB, the farmer headers, the bandits, the kidnappers, the terrorists, um, as part of this uh, grand amethyst. Uh, it's a very interesting thesis. Um, I'd like us to kind of uh, 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 talk a bit more about that during the Q&A, which we're going into imminently. I just want to highlight one other point here. Uh, this uh, idea of the emergence of Generation Z and this kind of disparity between them and the elite for decades that has always existed in Nigeria. Um, the difference now is that Generation Z, they have access to Instagram, to TikTok, to Twitter. They, they can see people all across the world and the fact that they are youths their age that are thriving and they say to themselves, why them and not us, right? Why does Miley Cyrus get to do what she does and I don't get to do the same thing? Um, and these questions kind of emerge and there's a lot of anger um, as a result, in other words, the elites can't pull the wool over the eyes of the common people in quotes the way they could in the past, uh, not with Gen Z. Um, okay, so, uh, so such a good uh, conversation. I'm going to uh, uh, waive my right to ask any questions uh, and open the floor directly uh, for a Q&A that I hope would be enlightening.